Welcome to Gospel Preaching, a presentation of Gospel Time Ministries Incorporated. I'm Dave Rigg, coming your way from my home about six miles north of Albion, Illinois. The scripture for my message to you today comes from the book of Romans. I'm going to read from chapter 2, the first 15 verses of that chapter, as always from the New King James translation of the original Greek text. So Romans chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or you do, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Now the verse 15 is my scripture verse for this message. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Would you pause just a moment with me for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for a blessing on the reading of the Holy Word. I pray for your guidance, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, that I might speak this message today in the way that you would want it to be delivered. And Lord, that you would continue to send these messages out all over the world on the internet to the people who need to get them. This I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. The title for my message today is, Is Your Conscience Clear? Is Your Conscience Clear? Now we're going to examine here in this message today what our conscience is and how to keep it clear. But before I get into that, I have a little story as usual to tell you. And today's story is about a building contractor named Clarence. It seems Clarence had a chance to secure a contract for a big construction project. He was going in to meet with the president of a corporation that had plans to build a huge new shopping center. Now, Clarence was ushered into the office of the president, and a secretary brought him some coffee and then left the room. The conversation with the president of this corporation was friendly, and Clarence knew he was giving his best presentation ever in his efforts to get this contract for a big project, which would mean a lot of money to him. Now, suddenly the discussion was interrupted when the secretary re-entered the office and spoke briefly with the president. He stood up and said to Clarence, I apologize 
but I have to tend to a very important matter. I'll be back in just a minute or two. And he followed the secretary out of the room. Now we'll return to that story of Clarence in just a few minutes, but here's point number one of my message to you today. Point number one, we all have a conscience. We all have a conscience. Verse 15 in our text for today says, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Now that word conscience appears 31 times in the New Testament scriptures. So what is our conscience? Well, let's, let's go to the dictionary for a definition of the word conscience. And this is what it says in my dictionary anyway. It is a self-awareness that judges whether or not an act one has carried out or plans to carry out is in harmony with one's moral standards. Now, I like that. Let me read that to you again. The definition of conscience, it is a self-awareness that judges whether or not an act one has carried out or plans to carry out is in harmony with one's moral standards. So the Bible tells us that everyone who is born into this world is born with a conscience. Now, let me make one plain point clear here. Everybody, everybody, the saved and the lost, have a conscience. Now, only born-again Christians have the Holy Spirit, but people who have never been saved, they don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, but they do have a conscience. So, we're born into this world with a conscience. And as we grow up, we naturally learn the things that are right and the things that are wrong. We're taught those things by our parents or by teachers or by things that we are exposed to. These rights and wrongs are written on our conscience. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So Jesus says, everyone has some knowledge of what is good and what is evil. But here's the problem. Our consciences can get marred by sin. So when that happens, our consciences do not work properly. Our consciences can be swayed or persuaded by our desires, by our lusts, by our temptations, and by pride. Those things can get our consciences marred or destroyed or damaged in some way. It, it, <laughs> It's just natural when we hear of terrible things that some people uh, do, and we have to, when we hear about these things, just naturally we ask why a person would willingly do what their conscience has to tell them that this is a wrong thing to do. What can make us go against our conscience? What made, for instance, you all remember the story of the Columbine massacres out there in Colorado. And so the question in that situation is, what made those two teenage boys murder 15 of their classmates there in Littleton, Colorado? What made them do that? Surely they had a, we know they, they were born with a conscience. Another one going back even further into history. What made Adolf Hitler and the Nazis who followed him think that it was okay to murder all those Jews during World War II. Those, Hitler had a conscience. 
those guys who served in the German army doing what uh, the Germans did, they, they, they were born with a conscience. Well, let me put it this way. A conscience is like a square peg in our hearts. If we are facing a questionable situation, that square peg in our hearts begins to turn. And as it turns, it corner cuts into our hearts. And it warns us with a sensation against doing something wrong. If the conscience is ignored time after time, the corners of the square in our hearts gradually worn down and it virtually becomes a circle. Now, of course, you know that I'm using that just as an illustration. I'm not suggesting at all that we have a square peg into our hearts and as it turns, it finally turns that square hole into a circle. You see what I'm saying here, folks? As the conscience gets twisted around and moved around, it can change our hearts. And when that circle within our hearts begins to become that way, there is no sensation or no, no warning that we are doing something that we know is wrong. The Bible describes it, I think, very well in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, here he is, is that bird conscience, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So clearly the Bible says that it is possible to lose the effect of our conscience leading us to do what's right and leading us to not do what's wrong. Friends, God wants all Christians to pay attention to their, the Holy Spirit but also, you've got a conscience. And when your conscience tells you, don't do this, you know what's wrong, God wants us to obey that conscience, okay? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 tells us, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Another passage from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Listen to this. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, let's get back to our story of Clarence. Remember now, Clarence is in the office of the uh, president of a big corporation that plans to build a new shopping center. And if Clarence can secure this contract, it's going to mean a lot of money for his company. And of course, as the president and Clarence were sitting there talking about this project, if you were listening earlier, the secretary suddenly walked into the room, walked over and said something to the president, and he excused himself and said he would be back in a minute. So now Clarence is sitting there in the chair, all alone in this office, and looking around this very beautiful office of the president. He saw the president's family pictures sitting there on the desk. And then he noticed suddenly there was a contract sitting there on the desk of the president. Now, the president had evidently been studying a bid from a competitor. Leaning forward, Clarence could see a column of figures. But the total amount of a bid, perhaps from a competitor, was obscured by a Diet Coke can sitting on top of the contract. Well, as you can imagine, Clarence was tempted to reach forward and move that Diet Coke can so that he could see the bottom line of the competitor's bid, just how much money 
his competitor was willing to bid on this big project. But, as you might expect, the conscience of Clarence told him to leave that Diet Coke can alone. Well, as time moved on, and Clarence sat there waiting for the president to come back, he began to think about how much money he could make if he could just get this contract to build that shopping center. He thought to himself, this is his conscience talking to him, obviously, what harm could there possibly be in reading this private information that the president had secured, obviously, from a competitor for this job? After all, the president has left this contract right out there in plain sight. We'll get the rest of that story a little bit later on, but let's move on to point number two. Point number two, if you've already established in point one, we all have a conscience. Point number two, God wants us to keep our conscience clear. God wants us to keep our conscience clear. Acts chapter 24, verse 16. Listen to this. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. So when I say God wants us to keep our conscience clear, what does that mean? It means we must have spiritual strength to say no to the temptations that we experience from time to time in life. Consider David, King David. In 1 Samuel chapter 26, we find a good example of the conscience at work. If you know the story, King Saul received a report of David's latest hiding place and rushed there with 3,000 men. Remember at this time, King Saul was trying to kill David, and David's been in hiding. So the army are, is camped now where David is hiding, okay? Well, that night, the Bible tells us that David and Abishai slipped past the sentries of King Saul's army and stood over the sleeping enemy, King Saul. Now listen as I read the rest of this story. Beginning at verse 7 in chapter 26 of 1 Samuel. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp, and his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. And David said to Abishai, Here's his conscience. Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head, and let us go. There's clearly, friends, an example of David getting his conscience to tell him to leave King Saul alone. So clearly when David's standing there over a sleeping King Saul, David fought for the, and, and asked for the strength to do what he knew was right to do God's will. But, friends, <laughs> that doesn't mean David was perfect, and we know the story about his life well enough to know he didn't. There did come a time when David didn't listen to his conscience, and you know where I'm going, don't you? Listen as I read to you from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2, 3, and 4. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. 
So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Well, sad to say, obviously, this is one time when David did not listen to his conscience. David had to know what was right and what was wrong. David had to know that having anything to do with another man's wife was clearly wrong. His conscience had to tell him that. But did he listen to his conscience? No. So friends, clearly we all face spiritual challenges from time to time. In a survey that I found on the internet on uh, something called Discipleship Journal, respondents to a survey gave two reasons why they say it is so easily uh, a situation where we go against what our conscience is telling us is wrong and choose to fall into sin. Number two reason, we are physically tired. So if you're a born-again Christian, or even if you're not a born-again Christian, you know that you're tempted to do something, you know it's wrong, but if you are in a physically tired situation with your body, you are more likely to give in to that sin and ignore your conscience. The number one reason, though, why some people choose to ignore their conscience is they are neglecting time with God. And this is especially true for born-again Christians. You've got not only the Holy Spirit telling you what's right and what's wrong, but you have that conscience also as a double barrel, a, a double barrel guard, if you will, against doing wrong. But if you have not been spending time in prayer, if you have not been spending time in Bible reading, if you've neglected regular church attendance, you are vulnerable to ignoring your conscience. So the question is to you, my friends, how vulnerable are you right now? Is it possible that you are capable of disobeying what your conscience tells you is wrong and what is right? Where can we find strength, though, to choose what is right and keep our consciences clear? Well, the first thing I would say is let your conscience be guided by the Word of God. In other words, do what the Bible says is right. Again, you should be spending a lot of time reading your Bible, friends, and in reading your Bible, the Bible's going to tell you the things that are right and the things that are wrong. Another way, let your conscience be guided by the Holy Spirit if you're a born-again Christian. Not only is the conscience going to tell you, don't do that, but the Holy Spirit is also going to tell you don't do that. Romans chapter 9, verse 1 says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. So sometimes, friends, for the born-again Christian, it's not only the conscience telling you that don't do that, but the Holy Spirit also says don't do that. So there are times when the Holy Spirit and your conscience work just like my fingers and my hands are together here. Another reason how we can keep our consciences clear is to listen to what the conscience is telling us. You see, friends, the old devil, he wants us to ignore your conscience. Some people think, you know, the old devil sits on your shoulder tempting you and telling you, don't do that. Well, I don't think he does, but your conscience is telling you, don't do that. So listen to what the conscience tells you. Another way to keep your conscience clean through confession of sin and acceptance of God's forgiveness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says this, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, God will help you through difficult times. Friends, when King David sinned with Bathsheba, we know the story. He tried to cover it up. And it took a lesson, and actually a visit, uh, 
from an old prophet named Nathan to force David to confess his sins. Well, friends, I say to you, maybe God is using this old preacher named David Rigg to force you to confess your sins today. Maybe you've not been listening to your conscience and your, your conscience is seared like a hot iron because of sin. Well, if you'll confess that sin and ask for forgiveness, it'll be cleared. And then you can begin to listen and obey your conscience. Well, let's find out how the story of Clarence ends today. After wrestling with his conscience for quite a while, Clarence finally decided he needed to know what his competitor might be bidding on this big, big project, and he decided to take a peek. As he lifted the Diet Coke can up off the paper, he discovered that the can was not filled with Diet Coke. No, friends. Instead, it was a bottomless can filled with BBs. And thousands of BBs gushed out of the bottom of the can, ran all over the desk, and scattered out there on the carpet of this president's office floor. Don't you think Clarence should have listened to his conscience? Friends, in closing, let me ask you a very important question. How is your conscience today? Is it clear? Can you still do what your conscience says is right? Can you still not do what your conscience tells you is wrong? Can you resist the things that your conscience tells you to stay away from? Or could it be that you have allowed sin to sear your conscience? Friends, not only if you're a born-again Christian do you have the Holy Spirit, but you have a conscience, and so do all people, whether they're saved or not. God gives us, when we are born, an ability to have a conscience. And as we, over time in life, learn the things that are right and the things that are wrong, that conscience can help us to do God's will. So, i got to ask you the question, what is your conscience telling you to do right now? Is it telling you that if you've never been saved, that you need to take care of that and you need to ac accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today. Is it telling you to do that, my friend, today, if you've never been saved? What choice are you going to make now that you've heard this from me? You've never been saved. Your conscience is telling you that's the right thing to do. Are you going to do it? But what if your conscience is telling you to do something like repenting? You are a born-again Christian, but your conscience has been seared by sin in your life. Is your conscience right now telling you you need to repent of that? Is there something that you need to confess to God? Is there a wrong that you have done to someone that needs to be made right. I got to ask you this question in closing. What choice are you going to make today? Friend, is your conscience clear? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for the opportunity to come each week here on Gospel Preaching with these messages you lay upon my heart. Now, Lord, as it goes out all over the world on the internet, Please continue to direct it to the people who need to get these messages. This I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Well, if the Lord gives me another week to live, and I get the chance, I'll be back again next week here on Gospel Preaching with another message from God's Word. My prayer is that in the meantime, God will richly bless you.